Chapters eighteen and nineteen of Ward Number Six by Anton Chekhov, translated by Constance Garnett, eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter eighteen. Andrey Yefimitch walked away to the window and looked out into the open country. It was getting dark, and on the horizon to the right, a cold crimson moon was mounting upwards not far from the hospital fence not much more than two hundred yards away stood a tall white house shut in by a stone wall this was the prison so this is real life thought andrey yefimitch and he felt frightened the moon and the prison and the nails on the fence and the far-away flames at the bone-charring factory were all terrible behind him there was the sound of a sigh andrey yefimitch looked round and saw a man with glittering stars and orders on his breast who was smiling and slyly winking and this too seemed terrible andrey yefimitch assured himself that there was nothing special about the moon or the prison that even sane persons wear orders and that everything in time will decay and turn to earth but he was suddenly overcome with desire he clutched at the grating with both hands and shook it with all his might the strong grating did not yield then that it might not be so dreadful he went to ivan dmitritch's bed and sat down i have lost heart my dear fellow he muttered trembling and wiping away the cold sweat i have lost heart you should be philosophical said ivan dmitritch ironically my god my god yes yes you were pleased to say once that there was no philosophy in russia but that all people even the paltriest talk philosophy but you know the philosophizing of the paltriest does not harm any one said andrey yefimitch in a tone as if he wanted to cry and complain why then that malignant laugh my friend and how can these paltry creatures help philosophizing if they are not satisfied for an intelligent educated man made in god's image proud and loving freedom to have no alternative but to be a doctor in a filthy stupid wretched little town and to spend his whole life among bottles leeches mustard plasters quackery narrowness vulgarity oh my god you are talking nonsense if you don't like being a doctor you should have gone in for being a statesman i could not i could not do anything we are weak my dear friend i used to be indifferent i reason boldly and soundly but at the first coarse touch of life upon me i have lost heart prostration we are weak we are poor creatures and you too my dear friend you are intelligent generous you drew in good impulses with your mother's milk but you had hardly entered upon life when you were exhausted and fell ill weak weak andrey yefimitch was all the while at the approach of evening tormented by another persistent sensation besides terror and the feeling of resentment at last he realized that he was longing for a smoke and for beer i am going out my friend he said i will tell them to bring a light i can't put up with this i am not equal to it andrey yefimitch went to the door and opened it but at once nikita jumped up and barred his way where are you going you can't you can't he said it's bedtime but i'm only going out for a minute to walk about the yard said andrey yefimitch you can't you can't it's forbidden you know that yourself but what difference will it make to any one if i do go out asked andrey yefimitch shrugging his shoulders i don't understand nikita i must go out he said in a trembling voice i must don't be disorderly it's not right nikita said peremptorily this is beyond everything ivan dmitritch cried suddenly and he jumped up what right has he not to let you out how dare they keep us here i believe it is clearly laid down in the law that no one can be deprived of freedom without trial it's an outrage it's tyranny of course it's tyranny said andrey yefimitch encouraged by ivan dmitritch's outburst i must go out i want to he has no right open i tell you do you hear you dull-witted brute cried ivan dmitritch and he banged on the door with his fist open the door or i will break it open torturer open the door cried andrey yefimitch trembling all over i insist talk away nikita answered through the door talk away anyhow go and call yevgeny fyodoritch say that i beg him to come for a minute his honour will come of himself to-morrow they will never let us out ivan dmitritch was going on meanwhile they will leave us to rot here o oh, lord can there really be no hell in the next world and will these wretches be forgiven where is justice 
open the door you wretch i am choking he cried in a hoarse voice and flung himself upon the door i'll dash out my brains murderers nikita opened the door quickly and roughly with both his hands and his knee shoved andrey yefimitch back then swung his arm and punched him in the face with his fists it seemed to andrey yefimitch as though a huge salt wave enveloped him from his head downwards and dragged him to the bed there really was a salt taste in his mouth most likely the blood was running from his teeth he waved his arms as though he were trying to swim out and clutched at a bedstead and at the same moment felt nikita hit him twice on the back ivan dmitritch gave a loud scream he must have been beaten too then all was still the faint moonlight came through the grating and a shadow like a net lay on the floor it was terrible andrey yefimitch lay and held his breath he was expecting with horror to be struck again he felt as though someone had taken a sickle thrust it into him and turned it round several times in his breast and bowels he bit the pillow from pain and clenched his teeth and all at once through the chaos in his brain there flashed the terrible unbearable thought that these people who seemed now like black shadows in the moonlight had to endure such pain day by day for years how could it have happened that for more than twenty years he had not known it and had refused to know it he knew nothing of pain had no conception of it so he was not to blame but his conscience as inexorable and as rough as nikita made him turn cold from the crown of his head to his heels he leaped up tried to cry out with all his might and to run in haste to kill nikita and then hobotov the superintendent and the assistant and then himself but no sound came from his chest and his legs would not obey him gasping for breath he tore at the dressing-gown and the shirt on his breast rent them and fell senseless on the bed chapter nineteen next morning his head ached there was a droning in his ears and a feeling of utter weakness all over he was not ashamed at recalling his weakness the day before he had been cowardly had even been afraid of the moon had openly expressed thoughts and feelings such as he had not expected in himself before for instance the thought that the paltry people who philosophized were really dissatisfied but now nothing mattered to him he ate nothing he drank nothing he lay motionless and silent it is all the same to me he thought when they asked him questions i am not going to answer it's all the same to me after dinner mikhail Averyanitch brought him a quarter pound of tea and a pound of fruit pastilles daryushka came too and stood for a whole hour by the bed with an expression of dull grief on her face dr hobotov visited him he brought a bottle of bromide and told nikita to fumigate the ward with something towards evening andrey yefimitch died of an apoplectic stroke at first he had a violent shivering fit and a feeling of sickness something revolting as it seemed penetrating through his whole body even to his fingertips strained from his stomach to his head and flooded his eyes and ears there was a greenness before his eyes andrey yefimitch understood that his end had come and remembered that ivan dmitritch mikhail averyanitch and millions of people believed in immortality and what if it really existed but he did not want immortality and he thought of it only for one instant a herd of deer extraordinarily beautiful and graceful of which he had been reading the day before ran by him then a peasant woman stretched out her hand to him with a registered letter mikhail averyanitch said something then it all vanished and andrey yefimitch sank into oblivion forever the hospital porters came took him by his arms and legs and carried him away to the chapel there he lay on the table with open eyes and the moon shed its light upon him at night in the morning sergey sergeyitch came prayed piously before the crucifix and closed his former chief's eyes next day andrey yefimitch was buried mikhail averyanitch and daryushka were the only people at the funeral end of chapter nineteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of ward number six by anton chekhov translated by constance garnett eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six